discussing all those issues with our guest today. Thomas O'Donnell is an analyst and consultant on the global energy system. Hello and welcome to TVP World. Good morning, thanks for having me. So when looking at the energy crisis, there are certain misconceptions surrounding this phenomenon uh, and its impact on the global energy environment, on businesses, on households, you name it. So the first one of these apparently is that we are at the mercy of Russia and that Russia is actually winning this confrontation. So what is your opinion on that? Well, um, I have a contrary opinion, but I think uh, uh, trying to be objective as an analyst here, one has to distinguish between the long term and the short term. In the short term, the one area in which Russia, Mr. Putin, has the greatest leverage over Europe is in natural gas. Europe made a big mistake, not Poland, but particularly Germany and certain other mem member states, made the mistake of being overly dependent on Russian gas. On the other hand, for Mr. Putin, gas, he makes much less money usually on nat exporting natural gas than he does on oil. So this is something he knows he's going to lose in a year or two or so. The European Union will become independent of his natural gas. So he's using the leverage to the maximum right now with the intention of dividing Europe, of causing social and economic tensions. So, so it's a the tool of term, blackmail. It's being control. used purely for blackmail. There is no economic yes. um, argument for the natural resources of Russia, in particular for natural gas to be used in this way. And yet Putin is doing right. that. But when we're talking about the yes. long term, um, isn't it the case that Russia is actually <clears throat> undermining uh, one of the very foundations of its regional economic policies, effectively um, hacking at the branch on which it is sitting? And it will soon actually face the reality okay. of this particular sector plummeting down all the way to the ground. No, exactly. I mean, they were already under stress globally in the sense that with the American fracking revolution starting around 2005, this really disturbed Mr. Putin. Uh, this was a this revolution was flooding the world with really cheap natural gas that can be transported as LNG, such as it's being done to uh, 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 Poland, also from Qatar. Lots of cheap natural gas. There's plenty of natural gas in the world. The West has the finances. The West has the technology. It has the functioning markets. In a couple of years, it can reduce. Russia from a so-called superpower in natural gas and oil to a second or third rate power. He's sacrificing this, the interests of the nation for his particular interests in going after Ukraine. So as a result, we're seeing that Russia, which was famously referred to um, as a gas station masquerading as a country by the late Senator John McCain, is facing troubles which are of its own making. We are hearing reports that it is actually burning excess gas and oil because it has no way of selling it due to the fact that exports into the European Union are now decreasing in volume. So when looking at the situation, of course, you've mentioned the issue of fracking and also of many other methods um, in which we can obtain resources. Now, this has been controversial in some countries because of the environmental implications. Do you think that right now these countries and governments will be more ready to continue prospecting and extracting gas yes. from uh, these particular uh, deposits? But also later on a broader question. Can our revolution and should our revolution in the energy sector be a green one? Hmm. OK, well, uh, OK, there's a lot there in your question, uh, but it's a really good question. Uh, let me just say first, I, I like to I like to talk about Russia as uh, or Mr. Putin as Hugo Chavez with nuclear weapons. But <laughs> um, so, yes, natural gas is necessary. Um, there is really no substitute for generating electricity. We can have a certain percentage of green energy, renewables, wind and solar, uh, depending on your country and your weather. That makes sense, but that's variable. So you need something when the wind is high, when the wind goes low, you need something to replace it quickly. There is no grid scale storage technology that's generalizable. 94% of all the grid scale storage in the world is pumped hydro. 
But from Paris to Moscow, it's the great northern plain. It's all flat. So that's not going to work. And what even the German government quietly was doing all along and the Green Party approved of is using small um, gas turbines all around the country to back up their wind farms. So I think that's, you know, that's going to continue no matter what. More wind will actually mean more needing more natural gas. And a lot of that will come from fracking. That's a good thing. It's very cheap if it's done responsibly. I would also say it's very important for a base load. So you don't have to mess with this variability is to have what nuclear power you can install, large scale nuclear power to replace coal plants. That's the rational modern way of the future, in my opinion. So some countries are still reluctant to embrace nuclear power. Indeed, they're actually um, quite insistent on getting rid of the capabilities they already have. So this is a step in the opposite direction. Do you think that it is all about the mentality in certain countries related to the association of nuclear power with something that's intrinsically hazardous, um, notwithstanding the fact that we have ample evidence that compared to fossil fuels, nuclear power, when handled responsibly, um, and of course that's always the necessary precondition for every industrial activity, but when it is handled properly, it will have a much lower um, environmental impact. Uh, I mean, when it comes to the carbon footprint, there is simply no contest. So. In the end, do you expect Europe to embrace nuclear power as the sort of necessary alternative, this sort of necessary um, constituent part of a system, which of course will necessarily have to rely more and more on green energy, but also, as you said, it will need uh, this reliable backup? Right. Well, I think the European Union is going through a transition. And actually, if you listen closely to the statements by van der Leyen, by the energy commissioner, Kadri Simpson, you can see there's a transition. You no longer get this, what I would, what I called here in Germany, addressing the Green Party, a renewables fundamentalism. This idea that 100% renewables, no nuclear, no fossil fuels is possible. Now, much of that was ideologically driven in Germany for particular national, cultural, and so forth reasons. Um, there was a certain revulsion at nuclear in general because Germany was the country that the two superpowers were going to have a war, you know, uh, using uh, using nuclear weapons that had nothing to do with nuclear power, but it was associated in people's minds, um, you know, that sort of thing. And also ideologically, there was a uh, the Green Party started as opposition to big corporations. And while well, you can't do nuclear without big corporations, they said. So these are the reasons. But the period when people could have these illusions of 100% re sort of romantic illusions of 100% uh, solar and wind are gone because they were ignoring something that in fact Poland did not ignore, the national security aspect. You have to get serious about having reliable energy and low carbon. And you know, the reality is that's nuclear and that's why we're seeing a renaissance. The American government is uh, under both Democrat and Republican presidents has been very active, not only with Poland, but throughout the whole so-called Three Seas region, um, making uh, agreements to facilitate building of new nuclear power. And I think there is a renaissance coming. Brussels has to catch up on this. I think there should be a new Mesmer plan using the word, you know, Mesmer was the guy, the prime minister in, in France who built 56 nuclear plants in 20 years, well, actually more like 15 years. 50 years ago, that can be done again today. Europe should have a similar sort of plan to build 300, 350 nuclear plants in 15 or 20 years. That would give real energy independence, real low carbon energy. It, it would be a big step forward. And do you think the opinion. small modular reactor technology could also help? Yes, I think um, SMRs, as we say, have a, a niche, have a particular role. Now look, in Poland, for example, you have these huge coal-fired power plants. Yes, you could put a bank of these SMRs to replace some of those. But really, in the long run, you can't beat these big monster Westinghouse, South Korean, or even French, huge Generation 3 reactors. Once they're amortized 20 years, they'll last 180 to 100 years. They're essentially paid for, for like, you know, uh, that length of their lifetime and the cost of nuclear energy, the fuel, is almost insignificant compared to the cost of natural gas, say, or coal. Okay, so 
I, SMRs have applications, especially for smaller towns, but especially in industry. They not only produce electricity, but they can produce process heat. So actually in Poland, it's um, uh, some of the industrial, uh, industrialists who are interested in this for uh, the chemical industry, for metals industry, and so forth. So there's definitely a role for SMRs. But the Polish national plan, the energy transition plan, is to build these, these large ones. So it's a versatile and safe energy source, and hopefully uh, there will be more and more countries that will be able to overcome these nuclear heebie-jeebies and start thinking about it realistically. But on the other hand, there is another misconception. Uh, people who are not very friendly towards green energy, they are saying, oh, it's a green energy crisis. This is all because the world's starting to, to turn away from reliable sources, by which they, of course, mean fossil fuels, unsurprisingly, and they say it's all because of this but this is yet another thing that we need to deal with because it's easy to overlook um, how important it is not just from the um, standpoint of environmental protection but also from an yeah. economic standpoint that this is not just uh, somebody's um, fancy idea this is actually uh, the whole industry of generating energy from renewable sources uh, is very much something that's forward-looking just needs the, these technologies to be um, to become more um, efficient and reliable than they already are so that this next step can be achieved well I would say this you, you get these arguments, as you say, between two sides that's polarized, as many things are today in, in, in our politics in the West. Um, some people say the cause of the present crisis is renewable reliance, and others will say, you know, uh, the opposite. So I think it's actually um, a little more complex than that. These absolute arguments don't work. You have to look at each particular case. And if I may briefly, let's look at the... Um, uh, winter of 2020, 2021 in Europe. There was the year before there was lots of extra gas, huge gas in storage and companies stopped investing in natural gas, right? And it was down, uh, industry was down from COVID. What happened that winter, it was extremely cold and the wind didn't blow. So yes, there was a fault of wind in the sense that Europe had an overdependence on wind without any energy storage that could you know, had stored wind power from earlier that could be used, in which case they had to take natural gas that here in Germany supplies half the heat for homes and a lot of industry and had to draw that out of storage to generate electricity, running it down to nothing in, in storage. And then Mr. Putin started in August of the next year refusing to supply the natural gas he traditionally did, the uh, gas prime traditionally did to refill it. And that was the beginning of our present crisis. So yes, it, it wasn't that renewables are the cause of the problem. They were part of the problem, over-reliance. Just like over-reliance on Putin's natural gas, one source of natural gas is a problem. We need a more balanced, diversified situation and not this extremism of 100% renewables, no nuclear and no fossil fuels, no, that, as, as though gas is just as bad as coal. It's not, uh, uh, or, on the other, uh, or the other extreme, uh, people who deny global warming. Um, I think Poland actually has a fairly balanced, rational approach as compared to Germany. You want a certain achievable percentage of renewables offshore wind and a certain percentage of nuclear for the base load. And it, without having to revolutionize the whole grid with lots of new storage, the technology that doesn't exist for renewables, it's a more realistic plan, I think. Now, for the sake of clarity, of course, Poland's plan for its first nuclear power station is still uh, to be implemented, yes. but it is being yeah, yeah, factored yeah. in, as you said, right. uh, in the overall energy mix. So um, pretty much all the political forces on the Polish arena know that this is the way to go. We need nuclear power, um, having not been able to take advantage of it in the past. Um, but of course, yes. it is also a question, as I said, of approach of being able to strike the right balance and to ensure that the the supply of energy is clean, uninterrupted and reliable, uh, by which exactly. we, of course, mean exactly. that it should be as free of, from Russian influence right. as possible. Uh, Thomas right. O'Donnell, right. Bus, our guest today here on TDP World, thank you very much for joining us and sharing your insight you on the much. subject. Thank you. Thank you. And you're watching TVP World. Please stay with us for more latest news and updates. <laughs>